You are listening to the ODAT Chat Podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go of what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Well, hello, my loves. Thank you for downloading the podcast. My name is Arlena, and I'll be your host. I'll keep the intro short this time, but I will share that I have some exciting plans for the podcast. I'll be adding a second weekly episode that will cover recovery rants by yours truly and a series on how to work the 12 steps. Announcements will be delivered in the newsletter. So if you're not on it yet, you can sign up at odatchat.com. So today my guest is Vanessa Klugman. She is a retired physician, ACC certified life and recovery coach and owner of Resilience Recovery Coaching. Vanessa shares her story, which includes a moment of reckoning that is like a scene right out of the movies. And like most of us, the fall from grace is painful, but sometimes the greatest gifts come from our biggest failures. And this is one of those stories. One last thing before we jump in, if you would be so kind, please leave me a review on iTunes. It helps other people find the podcast and it's a huge encouragement for me as well. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Vanessa. Vanessa, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you. Thanks. I'm really happy to be here. We met through the She Recovers community. We are both She Recovers coaches, and uh, it was so nice to meet you, and I'm so glad that we created this little space so that we can have a discussion. Um, I would love to hear your story. You're from South Africa. You're educated. You're amazing, obviously. <laughs> so um, yeah, just love to hear like your experience, strength, and hope, and we'll jump into some questions. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me because I really enjoy telling my story. It's been a very healing process for me and my journey. So I am a physician. I'm in recovery. I've been in recovery since June of 2015 when I came into recovery for an addiction to prescription painkillers and anxiety medication. But I really say I'm in recovery from an unlivable life. Um, I had a really loud inner critic that fed me these um, limiting beliefs that were not serving me. And the one limiting belief that was that my worth was equated to how much I achieved. And the other was that my worth was equated to how much I gave to everyone and did for everyone around me. Um, And those led me to feeling this inner sense of discontent and dis-ease and a lot of anxiety. Um, And so I reached out to these poor coping mechanisms to alleviate those feelings. So um, I'm going to go back to the beginning so you'll understand where where and how those limiting beliefs developed in my life and kind of what happened. So I was born in South Africa, um, and I came from a family that really valued academic achievement and service to others. So my grandfather was a cardiologist. My father was a physician. There were lots of nurses, social workers in my family. And I decided I wanted to be a doctor when I was like eight. I was really, really young, and I did not ever stop. I never veered from the course. I never doubted my decision. I just continued. Like I, from age eight, that was what I was going to do. And when I look back, I, I mean, it makes sense that that's what I chose because it, it kind of, what, what better thing could I have chosen to be more, to create those achievements that I want that define my worth and a way, a career that I could give to others through, right? Um, And also, I think from a really young age, I was fascinated with why people suffered, like what caused human suffering, physical and emotional. And I really felt called to like alleviate the suffering of others. That was, that's been a calling and that's been a thread that's been true through my entire life. Um. And my dad was a physician and he was a role model for me and someone I really admired. And so that also made sense as to why I chose it. So when I was 15, my family immigrated to the United States and um, to Chicago. And that was a very traumatic experience. I didn't realize it then because I was just trying to survive. But um, looking back on it, I now see that 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 was trauma. 
Um, you know, I came from a very small community of very closely knit family and friends. I was very much supported. I had this like, group, you know, a lot of support. And then I come here at the age of 15. I didn't fit in. I felt like I didn't fit in. My accent was different. I had no clothing to wear. And I felt like I stuck out. And it was really the first time in my life that I felt like there was something maybe different about me or something like wrong about me, you know, and it just was, it was a really, really hard time in my life. Um, and it took me a number of years to start to feel somewhat, to start to develop roots here. And I went to, I went to college at the University of Chicago, which is a very serious college. And I met my husband, my future husband there at the age of 18. We, and we started dating when I was 19. And the two of us went through um, University of Ch undergrad, medical school together, we did our residencies together, and then he did his specialty and I did mine. Um, I was a very serious student. I worked unbelievably hard. I did not drink any. I was not, I had no taste for alcohol. I never drank at all. I mean, University of Chicago is not a big party school. I, I just studied. I worked hard. I didn't do any drugs. I was a very serious student. But when I was in medical school, um, I... Um, had some, I'd, I'd had insomnia from a very young age, from like the age of eight. And at, when I was preparing to go on call, I'd become even more anxious about sleeping because I knew that the following night I wouldn't sleep. What was going to happen? How was I going to function? What was, and I'd become incredibly anx anxious around the insomnia. And so I started doing things like going to my parents' medicine cabinet and taking their sleeping pills. And my dad had migraine pills, so I would take his migraine pills because they helped my headaches and they also gave me a sense of they had some stimulant in them, so they gave me some energy. So that really was the first time in my life that I started going outside of myself to, to sort, you know, to fix problems within, um, reaching outside to fix those problems. So I went through, I finished my fellowship, I started a family, I have three beautiful children which I'm, and I'm very proud of them and they have a great relationship with them. And I, and I always wanted to work part-time and I did, although it wasn't really part-time. I mean, it was supposed to be part-time, but there was no such thing as part-time in medicine. So I started, I trained as an endocrinologist and I started um, working in the practice that I stayed in until I came into recovery. So for more than 20 years, I was in the same practice. And I chose endocrine because it was this beautiful specialty where I could get to know my patients intimately. I sort of was like their, their family physician. They knew me, I knew them. I really viewed medicine as a privilege and a calling. And I treated it as such. I loved it. I loved getting to know my patients. I loved taking care of them. I loved um, really trying to understand what was going on with them besides their medical complaint. You know, what was going on at home? What were, how were they feeling emotionally? The problem was that over the years, medicine really changed. Um, you know, the medicine I entered and the medicine I left was not the same career. There was electronic medical records and I did not use a computer. I started getting really stressed and there was a lot of pressure to see patients really fast and how productive are you and are you productive enough? And I started becoming very anxious at work. I started bringing, I, brought, I always brought work home. I had very poor boundaries with my patients. You know, I gave some of my patients my home phone number, um, at, you know, my cell phone so that they could get a hold of me. I just was very, very poor at setting boundaries and protecting my own time. Um, I would lie in bed at night, like checking my computer before I went to sleep, you know, and, and it was just really, really poor self-care. And then when I was 39, I had a panic attack. Um, and I was, um, you know, even though I was a physician, um, I honestly thought I was dying. I'd had a busy day. I was lying on my couch. My heart started beating really irregularly. And I went to this place of like, I'm, I'm dying. There's something seriously wrong with me. And I ended up getting admitted to the hospital. And they said, nothing's wrong with your heart. You have generalized anxiety. So, and now looking back on it, I can see that the anxiety was sort of the culmination of this like pushing, perfecting, proving myself, that pressure of doing that for all those years and trying to be everything to everybody was, was culminated in this anxiety. 
Um, and that was given, I was sent to a psychiatrist. I was given medications, way too many medications. I was given, you know, sleeping pills, which were a problem for me because I had an addictive personality. I was given pills for um, anxiety. I was given pills in case I had a panic attack. And um, I took the pills and they would help for a while. And then one of, then I would start getting anxiety again and they would give me a new pill and I'd get anxiety again, a new pill. And this is kind of like how my life went for many, many, many years. And then about, and I forget the time because the time is starting to blur, but maybe eight years ago or so, I went on a vacation to celebrate my anniversary with my husband. And I was on a bike and I flipped myself. I hit the front pedal, the front brake, and I flipped myself off the bike and I broke my arm. And I was prescribed Vicodin for the pain. And as soon as I got that Vicodin, I had. Truly what I think now I know is, is called the magical connection, which is it, it really honestly made me feel like everything was normal. Everything was fine. It was all okay. This is how I'm, this is what, this is what I'd been missing all these years. It took away my anxiety. It gave me energy and I felt at ease. And um, it was in the days when there were no, um, where doctors did not, were not careful in those days about how much Vicodin they gave people. So I would get really a lot of Vicodin with many refills. And I got, and I realized after a period of time that I'm not using the Vicodin for the pain anymore because, oh, I ended up with a frozen shoulder. So I had physical therapy and then I kept getting Vicodin because it's lasted for like nine months. And I, I was taking the Vicodin I realized to make me feel good and not to control the pain. So I went to my husband and I told him, I think I have an addiction to the Vicodin. I think there's a problem here. And I decided to just get rid of the Vicodin, go through the withdrawal. And I did. I It was a horrible withdrawal. I had muscle aches, muscle cramps. I think I was taking five Vicodin a day or something like that. I had to wean myself off. And it was really, really hard and really painful. And I decided at that point, like I made a vow to myself, I will never become physically addicted to Vicodin. This was hell to go through this withdrawal, just not going to happen. And I went along for a few years and then my anxiety started really getting unmanageable. And it was for a number of reasons. I think it was my parents were elderly. There were a lot of crises going on with them, health crises, my two oldest daughters were in college. I was missing them a lot. My work, as I said, was becoming really, really difficult and not enjoyable anymore. A lot of anxiety around work. And I had decided I wanted to get off one of the medications that the, the psychiatrist had prescribed for me. And because I read that taking this long term could cause dementia and I wanted to get off it. And as I weaned it, as I started coming off it, my anxiety just got unbelievably unbearable. Um, and even though that psychiatrist told me I could stay on it forever and I could even use more, I just didn't really wanted to get off it. I just didn't think it was good for me. So um, I was having terrible anxiety and I had, and coincidentally, I had dental implants that I needed done and I was re-prescribed Vicodin for the dental implant pain. And as soon as I took the Vicodin, once again, there was that sense of like ease. This is I've, I've found the answer, but I wasn't going to take it to get to that level of dependence, but I had in some way told myself that I needed that Vicodin for days where my anxiety felt unbearable. And unfortunately my prescription ran out. And so I had to figure out how I was going to get this Vicodin. And I, you know, looking back, I'm like, it is so shocking to me that I did something so out of my value system, but I actually started visiting one of my elderly patients at her home, her apartment, and I used to prescribe Vicodin for her. And she had some, I went to her bathroom to use the bathroom and she had Vicodin sitting on the, t on the counter. And I took some of her Vicodin out of her bottle and I planned and managed to go visit her a number of times over that year to get Vicodin from her bottle. And it turned out that her son was a DEA agent. And I had no idea, although she did kind of tell me something about her son working for the government. And I don't know if her, that was her trying to warn me. And I, But she never said anything about him being a DEA agent. And there was a day in June of 2015 where she called me in the morning and asked me for her Vicodin 
the, the actual prescription. And I said she could come in and get it. And she asked me to please bring it to her home because she couldn't come in that day. So I took the Vicodin prescription to her home and um, they had said the DA had set up a sting and they videotaped me taking Vicodin out of her bottle and I was arrested. So that day was the most traumatic day of my life. And I was in complete shock and truly like I had put myself on this pedestal of perfection my whole life. And it got shattered that day. It got completely shattered. And I I knew it was up to me to pick up the pieces. I, no one in my life knew what was going on. My husband knew I was anxious, but he didn't know I was doing this. Um, No one would have ever suspected it of me because I gave off a facade of I've got it all together, yet inside I was dying. So it looked all good on the outside, but on the inside, I was struggling so badly and I felt so trapped and I had no idea the way out. I just didn't know where to go for help. And I was afraid. I was afraid if I went for help, my medical license would be in some way impacted or something would happen. So I, um, when I was arrested, I gave up my DA license, which in- immediately caused suspension of my medical license. And I was in denial. You know, I thought I'll be back at work in a week. Uh, You know, I'll I'll just call my partners and I was in shock and my husband helped me and he called my partners and we told them what happened. And I said, you know, just cover me. I'll be back in a week. I'm going to figure this out. And then the hospital called me and basically said, you can't come back to work right now. You need to sort this out. And my licensing lawyer told me I need to go to treatment. So I went to an outpatient treatment. I commuted from home to this treatment program and I honestly went in thinking I'm not an addict. I mean, I was like, I'm not an addict. I'm not physically dependent to this Vicodin. So that means I'm not an addict. I mean, what do you mean I'm an addict? And then when the, when the psychiatrist there told me, you know, addiction is continued use of something despite adverse circumstances, outcomes, I'm like, oh, well, maybe I am an addict. Maybe, yeah, actually, I think I probably am an addict. And, and at that point, I was like, okay, you know what? I need to figure out the causes and conditions that brought me here. And I need to... I need to really grow and transform from this point on. I need to make something out of what's happened to me. Um, So I went through the treatment program um, and I came out of the treatment program and I was like, now what? You know, I don't have a job. My job meant so much to me. It was my identity. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get my job back. I'm not sure what to do. And so I just really knew at that point that I needed to figure out ways to cope with my anxiety. I needed to figure out ways to move forward in my life. So I was kind of like faced with this open space and um, which was very uncomfortable for me because I was a busy person. I was always going. I was not someone who could sit in the present moment at all. I couldn't sit with myself. Like I could not be alone by myself. And I had to be alone by myself for so many hours. I was like, oh my God, what do I do now? So I threw myself into, actually I found a mindfulness meditation, a mindfulness summit. And it was the same, it was like a saving thing for me because I started to learn about mindfulness and meditation and Buddhist philosophies that really spoke to me, really, really spoke to me. And I went to AA. I was, it was encouraged in my treatment program to go to AA. So I went to meetings and I found a sponsor and I, she, and she was a gift. It was truly, a, she was a gift to me. She was an incredibly supportive, empathic person who really understood my journey and stood by me and was there for me on days that were hard. And I got sponsees and I worked the steps and I, you know, I did everything I, I was told to do. Um, and I didn't, I did many things. I was, another thing that was very helpful to me was that I had an incredibly supportive husband. Um, He'd really been through life with me from the age of 18. And initially he just was there to support me. Then once I got through the treatment program, he was angry. He didn't understand. He was a, you know, he'd been like a very, um, he's a very honest person and and a very, very values-based person. And he could not understand how I'd done what I had done. And when I explained to him how trapped I had felt and how fragile I'd been and, and how I just did not know where to go for help and how scared I'd been, he just really understood and he was there beside me. 
And he and he just went on this journey with me to understand and to grow and to learn everything I learned. And it was wonderful. So that was incredibly helpful to have someone like that in my life support me in that way. Um, and then along my journey, I was, you know, Every day in the mail, I would get some bad news. My Medicare was taken away from me. My malpractice insurance was removed from me. My board certification was removed from me. One thing after another was just taken away. Um, and as that went on, eventually, and, and I was on probation, I got a probation and I completed my probation. And at the completion of my probation, finally, they would be, they would be able to go ahead and try and get my medical license back. And at that point, I was like, this would be, I could get it back, but it would be useless. There's nothing I can do with it. I don't have a DA license. I don't have malpractice. I don't have licensing boards. What am I going to do with it? And I decided that for some, in some way, this had been a message that it was time for me to end that career and move on to something different. So I just, I heard from someone suggested recovery coaching and I was like, what is that? I've no, I had no idea about it. And I decided to go and train as a life coach with a specialty in recovery. Um, and I loved it. And I um, started a business called resilience recovery coaching a number of years ago. And that is where, that's what I'm giving my energy to now is to supporting other people in recovery and helping them find their way um, and meeting them where they're at um, and trying to get my story out to other people who are struggling so that they know that they're not alone. Amazing. Um, I have so many questions. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Um, well, you've been through so much and I know what it's like to have to rethink everything your entire life and start over and it's super challenging. And I'm you know, when we're kind of in the same place, you know, wanting to give back, I totally relate to that feeling of a calling to when you said that you felt a calling to lead people out of suffering. I wrote that down because I was like, yeah, me too. It's almost as if if you've ever experienced any kind of suffering and you have found a way out or a solution, there is this sort of internal calling that you want to help you want to spread the mes message and I've seen people in recovery when they first get sober, they want to shut they, the common, the common uh, expression I hear a lot is this should be taught to everyone, right? Yeah. Cause we're talking about coping yeah. skills, emotion management, um, connection, community, like uh, a lot of things that are actually missing from a lot of people's childhoods, right? Most people do not learn this stuff in childhood. So um, yeah, yeah I, I really related to your your desire, your calling. Um, you know, and another thing that I picked up from your story uh, so much, um, you probably saw me writing furiously, but <laughs> the idea of trauma from moving, you, you mentioned moving at age 15. I myself moved uh, when I was in the third grade. I don't remember how old I was, but what a traumatic experience that can be, but you were 15. That is like, that's like the worst possible age. How did the right. kids at school respond to you when you showed up with this cool South American accent? You didn't feel like you were cool? <laughs> you know, I don't even know. If they thought, I think they loved my accent. Right. That's true. Yeah, definitely. There was a lot of like, I love your accent. Oh, your, your accent's very cool. Yeah. I just, did, I just didn't feel cool. You couldn't no, receive it. Yeah. I didn't I couldn't receive it. I didn't feel cool. I had the wrong clothes and my mom had desperately run out and we we arrived in the winter of 78 which was a huge winter in Chicago it was blizzarding and we came from South Africa which was like a completely different climate. You know, no snow, no cold. And so my mom went out and got me a jacket that was literally like five sizes too big and I just was wearing this huge, big thing that made me look just awful. And it was, and it was the color of, I don't even know, like poop. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> and I just. You a poop jacket. That's rude. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Man, clothes are, I just watched that show on Netflix, Queen's Gamut. I don't know if you've oh, seen it yet. That. I you, oh, you have to watch it, but there's a scene where this orphan girl gets adopted and her adoptive parents send her to school and basically like these orphan rags. 
And all the girls are wearing like saddle shoes and poodle skirts and they're all super cute. And she sticks out like a sore thumb and they all mock her. I mean, kids at that age are, you know, that's probably junior high, 15, about junior no, high, high, maybe school. it was that's, high school. Yeah, it was a summer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, but at that age, I mean, kids are so superficial. All they care about is blending in and God forbid you stick out. So my heart broke for you a little bit. I was all, oh, that must have been awful. <laughs> That is traumatic, right? Because uh, like for me, it was a feeling of being self-conscious. Did you, is that, was that your predominant experience? Self-consciousness, not good enough? Yeah, self-conscious, not good enough, very much that. Um, Not fitting in. um, And and there was a lot of pressure. Like when I first arrived, it was the middle of the school year and they put me up six months and they wanted me to take my exams. And I was like, I haven't even been in these classes and you want me to take final exams. And I literally, because I had that whole thing around achievement and I needed to get straight A's and I literally lay on the floor and had a tantrum and screamed, I'm not going to do this. I'm not taking these exams. You know, I I felt so threatened in so many ways. That's a great word. So, Uh, and I relate to the, um, you know, you mentioned a loud inner critic and that you're worth being tied to achievement and service. Where did, where do you think that came from? Um, there was a lot, like I said, there was a lot of my family very much valued academic achievement. So my dad, you know, people really, my parents, my dad in particular um, was very, our grades were very important to him and how we did. And we got a lot of accolades for doing well. And not so many accolades at all for doing poorly. And there was there was a time in second grade where I wasn't doing so well. And I got a really, my father really got upset, not physically abusive, but very disappointed. And it definitely profoundly affected me because I remember that day. And from that day on, I was like, this is it. I am, I am going to get straight A's. There is no doubt about it. There's no questioning. And the pressure of that was just really hard like and and it's something I've had to work with my whole life because I am I don't know if you know the Enneagram but oh, it's I, the, do. I just it's discovered the, it yeah what's your what's I, your number it's three an achiever and it's yeah. not surprising to me because that is a very cool part of who I am and so even in my coaching practice I have to be careful like yeah. how much am I pushing myself to achieve You know, can I let go of achievement? Can I just be? Can I just sit? Can I just be at ease? Just sitting and being on a couch and lazing around for me is a very uncomfortable thing. Like it's a it's a challenge. You know, most people love to lie on the couch. That's not my personality (laughs) type. That's a challenge for me. Yeah, I totally. That probably causes you anxiety, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that I sort of have this, um, been mulling over this idea of the obstacles that we put, like the barriers that we create between ourselves and like receiving, like receiving, like what's blocking, what is the resistance to receiving? And it's typically, I need to achieve something before I can receive, like I have to struggle and strive and Mm -hmm. suffer before I can receive. Is that something that has been a... Does that resonate at all? I'm not sure if I have to struggle and strive before I can receive. But that isn't exactly what I feel. I think I just really want to achieve. Like the achievement in some way is so important to me and proves that I'm okay. And, in some and way, once I, you prove that you're okay. Then I have to do more. <laughs> so there is, so there is no, there is no just receiving peace. Yes, and, that's right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there isn't. Because as soon as I've received, it doesn't land that well. It's getting better, yeah. definitely. Yeah. It's definitely moving in a better direction. I can receive more now. I couldn't for many, 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 many years. Now I try to now I try to receive and let it just land, experience and enjoy it right. and say I've accomplished this and that's enough for it right now. I love that you found, um, you know, I see a little Buddha statue behind you I'm, that I'm coveting. I totally want one now. <laughs> I have, I have, a whole one, out, I have one outside. But <laughs> I, I love that, you know, the sway of life as painful. I, when you told me the story about the, told me, told us the story about the, the lady's son being a DEA agent, my jaw hit the floor. I was like, because in my mind, I was like, 
I feel like women are held to a different standard. I, I have just I just interviewed a doctor, uh, Dr. Jason Powers, who had an intervention. He was a medical doctor and had an intervention and just all the stuff. He was so, and he was able to keep his license and and I've heard of that. I know plenty of nurses who have lost their jobs, and I know several male doctors that have recovered from, who managed to continue practicing and it felt like there was a double standard but and then as soon as you said that it was the DEA specifically like you know in hospitals sometimes there's a, a liaison between the doctors and the nurses and law enforcement but mm-hmm. you you got straight to the law enforcement like there was no there was no tap dancing out of that one that must have been such a horrible feeling Terrible. Was that your moment of clarity, or that what maybe that didn't come till you got to treatment? I don't think I had the moment of clarity that night for sure. I think it came, and I don't even think it. Comp- I think it came on that day that I met with a psychiatrist. I realized I definitely had an addiction. My moment of clarity about why this all had happened came later, probably during my first year, and. My, my understanding that this was really a gift to me came during that first year as I started to really see and start to understand the patterns that had brought me there and see how I needed to work on them and uncover all the stuff that I had been pushing away and not wanting to face, boundary setting and all that uncomfortable stuff I didn't want to go to. I was like, oh, I'm not doing that. And, and, and I definitely had always been someone's unable to sit with my own pain, right? Like I wanted to get rid of my pain. I felt like there was something wrong with being in pain. Like in some way that was a failure to be anxious or or to have insomnia or to be uncomfortable. And that I needed to get rid of it immediately. Like it was something not to be sat with. And so the ability, the learning to sit with discomfort in meditation um, was really liberating. Like, and, and the understanding that it's a a part of human existence is to have pain, right? And that we cannot avoid pain. Like that is part of our, that's what I said about the Buddhist understanding is that there is suffering in life. That is part of life. It doesn't, it's not a doomsday kind of prediction. It's just, it is, it is, there is dis-ease. There's, there's dissatisfaction. That's life. What happens is if we try to escape it or we try to, um, if we try to push it away or resist it or distract from it, then it just builds, right? And we just, it doesn't work. We have to be with it. And that's, that to me was a huge shift when I learned that and I saw that. I mean, that says it all, right? Like I often thought that uh, addiction, any kind of obsession, mental obsession is a distraction, distraction from pain. And, and so it's kind of interesting because I feel like there's, um, there's two schools of thought that are both true. Like, like we have pain. So as, as a guidepost, it's like you put your hand on the hot stove, you burn it, you know, that's pain and you know not to do that again. Right. And, you know, you have, let's say we have pain in a relationship, you know, if we learn, Oh, what is our part? Or maybe we're, we're interacting with the wrong kind of person. Like maybe we should leave a toxic relationship. Like that's pain. That's useful. But then mm-hmm. there's the acceptance. What you said about pain equaling failure that really that really s- struck me because it's it's the meaning that we assign to the pain that often is just mm-hmm. off a little bit, right? And I love the uh, Buddhist. What what would you say is the Buddhist interpretation of how to deal with pain? So I love, they have, a, they have a number of different things. But one thing I love about the Buddhist idea is that they talk about the first arrow, right? So the first arrow is the pain, is the, the, just the things that happen in life. Like you hurt, you, you, maybe you stub your toe. That's the first arrow. The second arrow is all the stuff you add on to it. <laughs> I'm such an idiot. What a fool. Now I'm not going to be able to walk. For a week, I won't be able to do this or that. It's all that other stuff. That's the second arrow. So it's what we resist. Like the Buddhist idea is that it's what we, um, it's not being with things as they are. Wow. Right? Just as they are. I stubbed my toe. 
there is pain. It feels uncomfortable. I feel this pain. It feels like this. That's it. Just be with it as it is. It's when we add all that other stuff on that we really, su- that's when we get suffering. Yeah. Right? Rather that's the pain. suffering. Yeah. Right. That's, right. Uh, that's yeah. genius. I love yeah. that. Um, I want to be sure we spend a little time on, you mentioned a couple of things that Mm -hmm. people in early recovery suffer with a lot, which is insomnia and anxiety. They're probably linked. Mm -hmm. Um, You're Mm -hmm. the doctor. You tell me, I keep saying I'm I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on the internet. And I'm so grateful to have an actual doctor on the podcast. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about, I don't know if you have ideas about how to address insomnia, but if you want to talk about anxiety and, and um, coping strategies, I feel like that would be super helpful, especially people early in recovery. Yeah. So with anxiety, so I have been someone who had anxiety from a very young age, right? So when I came into recovery, I I really made it my goal to try to understand alternative ways to cope with anxiety, right? And that's not to say that I do not believe in medication. I think there are some medications, safe medications you can take. And certainly if you are struggling a lot with anxiety, I think you need to perhaps take those in order to I'm sorry to interrupt you what's a safe medication before I forget like um they're called like SSRIs so it's like Lexapro Zoloft Paxil those that that group of medications safe to take not benzodiazepines the ones that I became addicted to like Xanax and Ativan not those medications those are not safe to take at all because they're mind-altering so But so what I did, so the various things that I've put together in my program are the different coping tools that I use for anxiety. So the first is the grounding tools, right? So we really need to work on bringing ourselves out of that sympathetic drive. When we're anxious, our sympathetic nervous system, our fight, flight, freeze is in overdrive, right? We're hearts racing, uh, uh, we feel sweaty, we're shaky, we're like our minds racing. We have to ground ourselves, right? And bring ourselves back to the present moment. And the best way to do that is through breathing. So there are a variety of different breaths, breath techniques that I teach people, which is like the one is to do lengthening your exhale, So you count into four and out to eight, into four and out to eight. And just that simple thing can help calm the system down. There are other many other breath techniques that I also teach, but that's a very simple one. Another grounding tool or a tool that I use is tapping. So emotional freedom technique, and it's fantastic for anxiety. So tapping brings together like Eastern Eastern medicine and Western psychology Right. So, you know, I don't know if you've had anyone talk about tapping on the program. I have a couple of tapping videos on my in my uh, women's Facebook group that I've done for cravings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it can be used for craving. It can be used for anything, but it helps you tapping on the meridian points. And you have your setup statement. So say for when you're feeling anxiety, your setup statement is going to be something like, even though I feel anxious right now and my heart is racing, I deeply and completely accept myself, right? Or And then you tap on the statement and you tap through your whole body and it's really profound how much it can affect and reduce your anxiety level. Do you have any videos or anything, any resources that we can direct people to? Maybe it's on your website. So I don't have, I mean, I ha- oh, on my website, I do have a, um, a webinar that I've, released and there's tapping in that oh perfect okay well i'll leave all that in the show notes yeah there is and then nick ortner o-r-t-n-e-r has great tapping resources as well really jessica ortner is that his sister yeah that's his wife i think i think okay i think i'm not sure actually yeah (laughs) i've seen yeah we'll we'll not discuss their relationship i don't know what it is but um i've seen i've seen both of them do amazing tapping stuff. And I was fascinated by it. So I studied it and created a couple tapping videos for, for cravings uh, that are on mine, but I'll definitely leave links to your, um, your webinar. Yeah. And then, then I just include things in that whole course around um, meditation because meditation is profoundly impactful and reduces anxiety significantly. So how the type of meditation I do, we work on that, um, meditation, we work on acceptance, right? So there's an idea that when, when we're struggling, we're in a tug of war with our anxiety, 
it tends to increase. But when we drop the struggle and we just allow it to be present, even though that's very hard for people to get their minds around, it actually has the opposite effect. It starts to reduce in intensity. So we talk about how to open up and expand around our emotions and allow our emotions to be present and they will dissipate. They will. It, it, people are afraid to do that, but it does. It really does work. Um, and then I do Can I work ask you with, a question about yeah. meditation. Yeah. Um, the first thing when I, whenever I suggest meditation to people, the first thing I hear is, Oh, I can't meditate. I know. Do you want to dispel <laughs> some of the yeah. common misconceptions yeah. about what meditation yeah. is and how to do it? Yes, I do. I really do. <laughs> My mind is too busy. I've tried and I can't do it. Yes, I hear that over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah. I want to tell people that if they, if they think their mind is too busy, they should see my mind. And <laughs> if I can do it, they can do it. I promise you. No, um, it's not a contest. We're all a no, little bit crazy. No, no, no. <laughs> right. no but anyone can do it. Yes. So basically, what I want people to understand about meditation is that all it is, is a practice of paying attention to your breath. Yeah. And when you notice a thought and you notice yourself caught up in thinking, which will happen and which naturally does happen because our minds think and create thoughts, you just notice thinking and you just come back to the breath. And the thought will come in again and you might get caught up in a story and you notice and you just say to yourself, thinking and with, a, with an attitude of kindness and like curiosity, you just say, okay, thinking. And you just make no big deal of it and you come back to the breath. And every time you bring yourself back to the breath, is you're practicing mindfulness because what you're doing is you're training yourself to be present right here, right now for what's going on and not get caught up in the stories that we're telling ourselves the whole time, which are very often very painful because we have a negativity bias in our brain to go to the negative and not the positive. And then what that allows you to do is as you train yourself to do that during the day, when you start to notice that you're caught up in a story like he said that, and she said this, and I should have done that, and they should. You can, you can stop for a moment and notice it because you become better at doing that and say, oh, thinking. And you just bring yourself back to so good. Right, right here, right now, I'm cooking a meal. Yeah. There's no argument going on right now, right here. There's the smell of the food, and there is the colors. And, and you bring yourself back to the moment you're living in. Rather than that virtual reality. We need that so badly right now because right now it's so easy to get caught up, like we were talking about the election. Yeah. And politics in general are such a hot button. It's so easy to lose yourself in that. Mm -hmm. But not just that. It's like, I feel like everybody has something challenging going on in their life, whether it's a health issue, a relationship, money stress. Everybody has something going on where they can get lost in the story. And sure. I love how you explained that how simple meditation is. I don't know why people, well, I, I guess I understand why people don't, don't practice the meditation. It's like our minds are so busy. We don't, <laughs> we don't take the time, but I love how you explained it. And with the gentleness that just, it's just think, you know, just thinking, mm -hmm. you know, you don't even have to put any qualifiers on it. it thinking mm -hmm. and then bring it back to the breath a thousand times, but with, with the uh, gentleness, mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and I, I really do believe that when you were talking about acceptance, uh, are you familiar with Tara Brock? Oh yes. I'm obsessed. Tara, oh my gosh. Tara Brock was one of the per people in that mindfulness summit I first met and oh, she really? was the person I, I listened to every single in the first like six months of recovery. I sat and listened to every single one of her podcasts and took notes on all of them. Brilliant. And I would, Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I understand. Oh, she gets me. I've actually seen. I've actually gone to one of her retreats. Oh, I'm so jealous. I want to go. Oh, in person. Maybe yeah, maybe after the pandemic. But I listened to her. I was actually listening. When I can't sleep, I listened to her book, uh, Radical Acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to it this morning. And I was thinking, every mm -hmm. time I hear it, I hear something different. Mm -hmm. And she, she really talks about, uh, now, you, now I'm going to forget what it is, but it's basically avoidance of self. Um, the trance of unworthiness. The I love trance it. of unworthiness. Yeah. 
that is what I was caught in it was a trance of unworthiness. And it's a trance because it separates you from life, right? It separates you from being here because you're caught up in your trance of like, I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. I need to be doing better. Yeah. Isn't, and it's uh, it's so common. Yeah. That, I mean, you can, you can literally be lost in that your entire life. Yeah. Like people live entire lives in that trance. Right. And I think that's why recovery, you know, is so associated with terms like waking up. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Because we wake right. up to the present moment. Right, right. Well, listen, um, I, I want to respect your time and I want to be able to refer, make sure that people know how to get a hold of you. What's the best way? I'll leave links in the show notes in case you're driving. You won't have to write any notes down for our listeners. But uh, how do people get a hold of you? So they can reach me at my website. It's resiliencerecoverycoaching.com. I also have a Facebook page, Resilience Recovery Coaching. Um, and they can find me on Instagram, um, resilience underscore recovery underscore coaching. Um, and I do have that six-week one-on-one um, anxiety program, which is a one-on-one coaching program. So it's individual sessions around befriending your anxiety while living your best life. And I'm coming up with a new coaching program right now that I haven't quite decided what it's going to be called. Something like the journey home from the self-critic to self-love. Oh, and it that's so like good. My journey of self-exploration. Yeah, no, I, we all need that. I mean, everybody has that inner critic, some worse than others, I suppose, but um so needed. All these things are great conditioning for our minds and our and our hearts. And um, I am grateful for the work that you're doing. I'm so glad that we met and that my audience is going to get to meet you. Um, I think what you're doing is really important. And, you know, you have survived some very painful experiences. And I think that gives people hope that, you know, even though you, you know, lost your medical career, let's say that like a whole new door opened up for you. One that has more, maybe one that has more heart meaning. I don't know. It sounds like everything that you do, you bring your whole heart into. Um, I see that. So um, I think others do too. So thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to speaking to you again. Thanks, Alina. It was great. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.